What were Mike's favourite pastimes while incarcerated? Was he an avid chess player? No, I wasn't an avid chess player. Many people are, and I've known some some masters, um, you know, in the game. Uh, Shorty Shrekin goes to immediately comes to mind. He was a master, and uh, but I I've never played board games, um, nor cards or any other type of game. Um, so, you know, my pastimes, um, you know, other than um, my exercise routine, uh, was education. So my passion was to pursue my education and to um, increase my ability um, to deal with the world in which I lived and uh, to prepare myself for the future. So, um, you know, I can't re really remember. I didn't, um, I didn't do hobbies or anything like that. Uh, some people, you know, are very big into art. Uh, Shorty Shrek and Ghost was also a phenomenal artist. And um, there are so many artists within um, the prison system that are uh, just amazing artists. Um, you just mentioned Mitch Smiley. He, he happens to be a phenomenal artist and did a lot himself toward the, um, advancing the idea of arts in corrections. Uh, I know he did a lot, personally did a lot of work with that, and he needs to be, um, you know, kudos to him for that. But he's also a phenomenal artist. Chill Billy wants to know how dangerous it got for you once you dropped out of the gang. Well, it, um, <laughs> I guess the best way to answer that is that it comes with the territory. It, um, you know, the danger level increased twofold because I now not only had um, gangs, including my own, um, that would seek my death, but also law enforcement and guards and others that had been working closely with the gangs, some of them even becoming members. And then, of course, administrators who were taking bribes and so on. So um, the danger increased um, at least twofold as it relates to that. Um, so I not only had to concern myself with um, prisoners and gang members and their associates, but also with um, guards, administrators, and so on. And uh, so, yeah, it, um, it increased uh, at least twofold. Max wants to know if you still worry they will come after you. No, I, I don't waste a lot of time worrying really about anything. If I have a concern, which I make a distinction between worry and concern, uh, it's that um, I maintain my preparedness, but uh, more importantly, that I live my life. Um, I'm the type of individual who believes that I will not allow others to dictate how I live my life. I could have gone into the witness protection program. I refused. Um, it makes no sense to me, uh, simply because I take a stand for something um, that I'm now going to hide um, as a result of that stand. It, it just simply makes no sense to me. All right, we're with Mike Thompson, and he served 44 years in the California prison system. If you've just joined us, please put any questions for him in the live chat. We have got a backlog of questions that we're working through as well, but we're trying to get to the chat ones. We're prioritizing them. And if you've not subscribed to Mike's channel yet, I'm going to put it as a comment right now in the description box below this video. I'm told that your subscribers are starting to rise now. People are starting to notice that. So that is great. So Trantali wants to know, how was a typical assassination attempt organized from start to finish, from planning through to the actual hit? Hmm. Well, an assassination attempt is, is something entirely different than just a head-up knife fight. Um, so typically where an assassination is involved, then um, depending on the group, in this context, I'll refer to the brand, the Aryan Brotherhood, um, about that. So that it would be you have a, a, a group of individuals who are all capable of carrying out the assassination, but a number of factors would come into play depending on what's going on with the organization. So that if you have individuals who may be in trouble, 
And by trouble, I mean if, say, drugs were outlawed and that person was using drugs, nothing is done to that individual. But the first mission that comes up relative to an assassination, um, he would be picked for that. Uh, the other alternative is that the question is put to the membership. Does anyone want to raise their hand to do this? And oftentimes, more times than not, that was the case. Somebody would raise their hand and say, I'll take care of this. Um, and so it's, it's a matter of utilization of your resources. The person that's in the best position uh, to fulfill that contract um, by way of, of place, opportunity, uh, weapon, ability, skill, uh, manipulation, those are all factors that come into play here as it relates to the organization of an assassination attempt. Um, the idea behind the brand uh, and any member of the brand was that that person was a member of the brand because they had the skill set necessary to fulfill something like an assassination, uh, just as they did uh, to go to any prison and control that prison by himself. So the same is true here. Um, so it would be the effective utilization of your resources as it relates to what's about to occur. Selection of weapon and um, everything else that goes along with that. Timing, circumstance, um, subterfuge, uh, putting a person to sleep, playing a person out of the pocket, uh, putting staff to sleep, manipulating staff as it relates to position. I mean, there are just a multitude of factors that come into play there. And... Um, but that's typically how that would work. Were weapons always readily available? Yes. Yes. It, um, anything can be a weapon. I mean, that's essentially, you know, we get the idea oftentimes in, in listening to others talk about the prison system that, um, you know, that the weapon has to be some big bone crusher that's, um, you know, driven all the way through the individual. Um, you know, the, the, um, I've been attacked with the blanks out of boots that were made in the shoe factory, boot factory at Tracy. You know, it's a very, very short piece drawn back on both sides. It's not over three or four inches with a handle on it. Usually typically made for, you know, a neck shot. Um, but, um, you know, I've seen people melt plastic, um, and twist it so that it twists into, you know, it's good for one shot, um, is all it is. I've seen people melt razor blades into plastic. It's called a prison-made weapon. Um, and there's a big difference between a prison-made weapon and um, uh, a prison-made knife. So, you know, many things constitute a weapon. Um, and that is, in the hands of the right individual, the damage that it can facilitate. What is a paper shank? A paper shank is rolled paper into a cone. You want to remember that paper is made from wood and that oftentimes treated and then um, burnished, it becomes hard. So it's good for one shot and it has to go to a soft spot in the body. Um, but it, it's rolled in a cone. It comes to a point. A lot of work can be done. Some render the paper down and then reconstitute it and then form it uh, into a block and then shave that block down into a point, burnish it, which hardens it. And like I said, it's good for one shot. What is a stinger and can a stinger be weaponized? What kind of gun? Um, you know, like those heating filaments in Arizona, they call them stingers. Oh, stingers. Yes. Uh huh. Did you have those? Uh, back in the day before they, you were allowed to buy them. At one point you were allowed to buy them out of the, um, can canteen and, uh, you know, it's just, you plug it in and you, well, you drop it in the water and then you plug it in and it heats the water up. But back in the day we had three piece razors and the razor blades for those, uh, were double edged razor blades so that you used, um, a small bolt of some kind, even plastic, you could put it together. The point is, is that you had your ground wire and your positive wire going to a razor blade. And then they were held together by either plastic or something that was insulated. And so then the current would then run through those razor blades. You put that in the water and that would heat the water. 
Meg wants to know, how do you feel now reflecting on all these things that have happened in your life? Hmm, great question. Well, it depends on what I'm reflecting on. Um, I've oftentimes said that uh, I deplore violence, but the fact of the matter is I've been engaged in a lot of violence. You know, I've made uh, decisions that went contrary to my belief system. I attempted to rectify that. And um, in truth, I'm still working on that. Um, it's not something that happens immediately. I think any time that we seek um, redemption of any kind uh, relative to our actions and even our thought processes, uh, that that requires um, a process. So for me, I trust the process and I trust myself um, to um, take a hard look at uh, my past and um, you know how I might use those experiences to the benefit of others. Um, you know, I took a vow of nonviolence many years ago. I've been able to maintain that vow. Um, but oftentimes people confuse that with um, being a pacifist, and I'm not a pacifist. Um, I simply deplore violence and, and reached a point where I took a vow not to engage against violence, um, to initiate violence against another person. Should I be attacked or, of course, any member of my family, then I would respond accordingly. But uh, there are a multitude of other factors that are coupled with that question, uh, not the least of which is emotion. And uh, I spent so many years um, using stoicism to stuff my emotions so that uh, I didn't deal with my emotions. And now, um, in my old age, I have time to reflect upon that. And uh, so much of um, my emotions through that stoicism were arrested. So I never developed um, proper emotional regulation. You, you can't regulate your emotions if you don't know what those emotions are or you haven't experienced them. So that's a process. And um, it's actually one that um, I enjoy. Mags wants to know, with the long sentences you got, did you ever think you would get out of prison? No. Short answer. I did not. It, um, you know, I prepared each time I went before the board, which, which was numerous times. And um, each time I was denied because I wouldn't admit the crime. And I knew that. So I knew going in each time that I was going to be denied. So my expectation was that I would never get out of prison. Um, here in California, at one point in time, they passed a law that said that a prisoner did not have to admit to his crime. Um, and that's fine as laws go, but uh, the fact of the matter is, is that um, it was very, very, very rarely employed um, by the board to not require that an individual admit his crime. If you didn't admit your crime, you know, they couldn't deny you parole, for instance, because you wouldn't admit your crime. But what they could say is that you lacked insight into the crime. They didn't have to say that you're not admitting it, just simply that you lacked insight. And that lack of insight would be the reason for a parole denial. So that you can imagine that was I, when I was granted parole, um, it was a real surprise. Maria, what's Mike's secret of looking so young? He's got the looks of a movie star. Well, that's very kind of you. Thank you. Um, some people say that prison preserves you. I don't know that that's true, but uh, I've always taken care of myself. Um, my diet, I approach um, my well-being holistically. So I take what's called a biopsychosocial spiritual approach. At the root of that, at the foundation of that, is my spirituality. And I believe it's my connection to nature um, that guides me in everything else that I do, not the least of which is what goes on with me biologically, physiologically, my meta metabolisms, my circadian rhythms, my use of supplements, my eating habits, my exercise, and so on. All those things come together collectively, uh, I think, to create a balance. And so if I can answer that question and um, 
um, do so hopefully without sounding arrogant. Um, it's that fourfold approach um, to maintaining um, the homeostasis of myself as a living organism. Been told that your subscribers have doubled now since this live stream has started. So a huge thank you to the people subscribed and to those who haven't. Yes, putting, thank you very much. I'm putting a link in the chat right now. Come on, Mike has spent so many hours with us. Let's support him and subscribe to his channel. So we've got a message from John here. How was the feeling to be out in nature and fishing in your canoe after serving all that time? <laughs> um, almost inexplicable. It, um, you know, it's something that I used to do as a young man. And um, one of my practices, I lived on a lake and uh, I would go out every morning before daylight and I would get in my canoe and um, <laughs> kind of silly now that I think about it, but at the time, uh, oftentimes the bear would come down to the uh, edge of the lake to drink. And if that were the case, I enjoyed sneaking up on them in my canoe and tapping them on the nose, startling them. It wasn't, it wasn't a very nice thing to do. But, uh, um, this time, uh, I have an 18 and a half foot um, French Canadian canoe that was uh, custom built in Chicago. And um, it uh, is an absolute joy. So I take it out to one of the lakes and, um, you know, I'll go out about dawn and uh, just paddle out and, and uh, have a real lightweight um, rod and reel. I'll catch a few trout, bring them in, and uh, that will be breakfast. So, um, yeah, I there's nothing like being out on the water. I'm, I'm water clan, and so we believe that all things come from the water. And uh, we also believe that that is the mother's blood. So being out in the water for me is um, um, a point of comfort. It's my comfort zone. Elliot wants to know if you knew Bobby Brimage and Cato Vargas. If so, what happened to Brimage? I don't know either. Next question is from JR. Whatever happened to the barns that AB couldn't get to so they killed his father? Yeah, Steve Barnes, uh, his father was uh, assassinated by the Aryan Brotherhood because Steve was testifying uh, against Blinky Griffin and Junior Snyder in a case for the murder of Steve Gibson. And uh, so he um, stepped away from the brand and became a witness for the state against those two individuals. Um, and as a result, they assassinated um, Richard Barnes, his father. But Steve, uh, unfortunately, um, died of AIDS um, some years ago. Um, I would say around in the 90s. I can't remember exactly. We were housed together in Tehachapi. And um, he paroled, I think, four or five times from there and came back. Um, Steve had a real problem with um, addiction. He self-medicated as a result of um, what had happened to his family. And um, he simply could not shake that. So we would prepare each time that he was going to parole, we would prepare him for that. And he would go out and he would do well for a minute. But he had so many triggers. And um, that ultimately led to him using. And uh, in this particular case, he used a needle of an individual who had um, AIDS. And he contracted AIDS. Last time I saw him, when he came back, he had AIDS then. And um, then he paroled and um, he passed over. Oh, dear. Cindy's asked, how were you when you were sentenced? I think that might mean how old were you? Uh, I was 22. And then Barry wants to know, how do you actually get through more than 40 years locked up in the toughest prisons in America? very carefully. Um, you know, the, the, regardless of what you're doing, whether you're a member of the brand or you step away from the brand and, you know, I stepped away from the brand and I did an additional 38 years in prison. Um, so, you know, it really is about survival no matter what, but it's how you facilitate that, that survival that makes the difference. In my case, 
Um, I continually educated myself. Um, my education was very, very important to me, but also the practical application of that education became uh, fundamental to me. Um, I needed to recognize, and hopefully did, that uh, over the course of my incarceration, uh, many people helped me. I had many people just step up and just simply help me in my education, in my pursuit of self, if you will. You know, my spirituality uh, was huge in that, uh, the ability to attend sweat lodge, uh, to hold the people's pipe and do ceremony with the people's pipe. Um, you know, that was huge towards the development of my humanity. And um, I, I, I guess that's about all I can say on that. I mean, I suppose I could elaborate more uh, if you'd like. I mean, because there are a multitude of factors that come into play there. Well, there's a lot of time to cover, isn't there? I imagine you're going to be elaborating a lot more in, in your books. Someone asked, are you, have you got a book coming out? Uh, thanks for asking. Um, I do. Um, I finished 10 chapters and I'm doing the book proposal right now. Um, and, you know, the, the 10 chapters that I've just finished take me from my growing up on the res and then uh, with my elder walks on top the things that he taught me by way of martial arts and horsemanship and and um, uh, dealing with cattle and you know, ranch life in general. Uh, but um, also those things that he taught me as it relates to my spirituality and the gatherings that I attended with him, the influence that he had upon me as it relates to that. And um, what was the rest of that question? I'm sorry. So it was about your book and when it's coming out. Oh, okay, thanks. I got lost there in my thoughts. Mm -hmm. That oftentimes happens when I think about my elder. I love him, and I speak to him every day, um, even though he's passed over. But um, those four, first 10 chapters um, deal with growing up on a res, being with my elder, he who walks on top of the wind, and um, then coming into prison, what it was like coming into prison, the various prisons that I went to, becoming a member of the brand, uh, the various knife fights, which were many, the times that I was shot, everything associated with that until that time that I stepped away. And um, so those involve the first 10 chapters. So my thinking is, is that I'll go ahead and publish that because I have it done. And then I'll work on the next 10 chapters, which will be, um, you know, what happened after I stepped away. You know, that's, that's 38 years worth right there. Um, and so far as, um, you know, becoming, receiving my credentials as it relates to my education, becoming a counselor in uh, drug addiction and as a life coach and a mo motivational speaker and um, starting Live, Learn and Prosper while I was still behind the iron gates. So, um, but, you know, the corruption I faced relative to the court systems and, um, you know, too often what would happen is that um, the expectation, I once had the ATF and the feds come at me and, and uh, insist that I testify in a case, and I refused. That was a recall prosecution of 40 members of the brand. And um, they said, well, then we can, we can count you on our side. And I said, no, you can't. Um, you know, I don't play that. Uh, I'm my own man. So, um, you know, what steps they then took to discredit me, you know, the beatings I endured as a result of, of um, working with law enforcement by law enforcement. So uh, it's an interesting story, I think. And, um, but that will be the, the second 10 chapters. I may wait and um, just put all 20 chapters together. But since I have these um, last 10 chapters completed, my thinking is, is I'll just go ahead and publish them publish them and, and get them out there yeah and i think some of the most hard-hitting and dangerous times for you are at corker and prison i know we've discussed these previously yeah. mm -hmm. just, just to bring the viewers up to speed then corker and prison even here in the uk it was reported in the independent newspaper that the prison had formed their own gang the guards had formed their own gang mm -hmm. they were doing gladiator games where the prisoners were fighting to the death if they refused they were getting shocked they had the ambulances ready Mm -hmm. And the incident report ready before they even murdered these prisoners. Because Joey Torres, who flew out here, we've done four episodes. We've served 40 years in prison in California. Some of it with Mike confirmed everything that Mike said. 
and for the guards to have their own gang. Mm -hmm. And when one of the staff members uh, went to court to testify against the gang of guards, he was wearing a bulletproof uh, vest. And the judge yeah. asked him why are you were wearing a bulletproof vest. Because mm -hmm. the, the guard gang had just done a drive-by shooting on somebody's house. Mm -hmm. This is this is just you think the prison the prisoners' stories are insane. The guard stories are corker and even more insane. Yeah, they are. I mean, there's no question about that. You're talking about Stephen Rigg. He was a lieutenant that took the information that I had provided to him about the murder of Preston Tate. He was shot in the head, and um, uh, it took enormous courage on his part. But that's the kind of man that he is. He's a former sheriff who became a correctional officer who was lieutenant at the time and eventually became captain. But, you know, he and others like him um, took extraordinary steps in appearing before the Senate Select Committee to testify in the incident that you're talking about. He was wearing a bulletproof vest. And Gloria Romero, who was the chairperson of the Senate Select Committee here in California, noticed that he was wearing a bulletproof vest and stopped the proceedings to ask that very question. And then he explained to her that um, his peers, other guards, had actually done a drive-by shooting on his home in order to prevent him from cooperating with the Senate Select Committee. That is insane. It is, yes. Yeah, yes. And we'll be getting into much more detail about that with the Joey Torres series of podcasts coming out in January and February. Hmm. And, part, and part one of that is a collaboration with Mike and Joey, and they hadn't seen each other for, mm -hmm. I think it was like 25 years. So we captured, yeah. mm -hmm. we captured yeah. that moment. It was great to see Joey. I love Joey. Um, he's a great human being. And, um, you know, after 25 years to see him again and be able to talk to him um, was just an absolute joy. And one that I very, very, very much appreciate. You know, you made that possible, Sean, and, and I'm grateful. Oh, I'm grateful you guys come on the channel. It's um, Seagull Guitarist has said, it strikes me that circumstances aside, organized gangs aren't that different from powerful businesses. Hmm. That said, does Michael think he'd have been successful as a legitimate businessman? Well, I'd like to think so. But you're, you're right in, in making the analogy between organized crime and legitimate businesses. That essentially is what organized crime is. It's a business. And it's run like a business. And, um, you know, there are other people... Um, that have stepped away from their um, prior relationships with organizations like the, the Italian Mafia. You know, Michael Franzi is a, a good example. Excellent, excellent businessman. And he acquired that acume with the Italian Mafia. He now brings that present day to utilize, you know, that knowledge that he acquired. And he just kind of flipped the script. And he now uses it for legitimate means and purposes. And it is a business. And that was my approach to restructuring the Aryan Brotherhood, actually, was to treat it more like a business and um, created the infrastructure for that and so on. That's why I felt a responsibility um, to engage law enforcement on the levels that I have. So Michael Francis is a friend of this channel. Have you got a podcast coming out with him, Mike? I do, yeah. We just uh, completed a, a, a podcast here, well, I guess it's been a week ago. And uh, so that'll be coming out. And, and, you know, Michael and his wife both are, are fascinating people, uh, very kind, very generous. And um, we're extremely courteous to, to uh, me and my wife. And we had a great conversation, a great sit down. And, um, you know, the, the interest for me in that is to see how you think with another person that is from another organization, but you share, you share so many similarities. You know, our approach to understanding law enforcement and the problems that this country has with corruption uh, within our law enforcement communities. But, you know, one of the things that Michael and I agree on was the idea that we're not saying that all law enforcement's corrupt. You know, we're saying for the most part, you know, law enforcement's got it right, but there are those elements within it that need to be checked and, and checked strongly. Um, you know, that's true of our judicial system is true of so much about this country. But, you know, for myself, um, I'm not a conservative. I'm not a liberal. You know, I don't really take a political position. Do I have opinions? Yes, I do. You know, if someone were going to label me, they would probably label me a progressive 
only because I want to see change. I don't like the leadership of any of the parties. Um, I think they fall way short of what this country needs by way of addressing issues like judicial reform, racism, and so on. And, um, you know, those things are, should be at the top of the list. You know, what usually undermines that is the economy. And um, so our government is run like a business too. And um, to me, that's unfortunate. So I'm progressive in my thinking in that I want change. I'm not suggesting that it needs to be radical change. I don't want to see that change brought about through violence. I want to see cooperation. I want to see communication. And I want to see a dialogue as it relates to these various issues. And I intend to generate that dialogue um, on my podcast. Jerry wants to know whether you ever feel like the 44 years you served were wasted. No, I, I, I understand the question in that it could be easy to um, assume that. And, um, but in my case, you know, my wife often tells me, she said, you know, you, you spent 45 years in prison for something that you didn't do. And more than anything else, I want those 45 years to matter. And so that's why I've taken a position of, of progressively speaking out about uh, the leadership that's needed relative to the change that should occur. Um, I have a body of experience, as I say in my intro in the podcast, and I want to bring that body of experience to the forefront. Now, I'm, I'm no different than anybody else. I have an opinion like everybody else does. But coupled to that opinion is a body of experience. I'm not, I don't have to imagine what certain things are like. I experience them. And so those are the things that I hope to address first and foremost, that which is based on my life experiences. So to me, the 45 years in that context is a blessing. The 45 years you served forged the character you are today. And the viewers are absolutely mesmerized and fascinated by the person you have become. Well, thank so you. So it, it, it most certainly uh, was not a waste. Okay, so this is from Rat is my name. Rat is my name. Um, what's up, guys? I'd like to know how important it is to really learn how to fight with a knife in the real world for self defense. In New York, knives, racers are huge because you can't carry. So, do they actually have? Do you actually have, um, can you go to places and learn to, to, to fight like that and legally? Sure. Yeah. I mean, the, the issue of Aikido came up earlier and you not only have, um, um, I'll just use the standard common term, sword fighting and knife fighting um, associated with that. So there are a number of disciplines that teach uh, knife fighting. Um, I think... <laughs> What's really important, I mean, here where I'm at right now amongst the Redwoods, uh, there's hardly an individual that doesn't have a knife on his side. Uh, but that knife is used for um, utility. It's, uh, you know, for cutting rope, it's, it's hunting, it's for skinning. And, um, you know, everybody here hunts and fishes. And, and so the knife is used um, within the construct of utility. Um, it isn't to say that it can't be used in combat, it can. And oftentimes you'll see most of your survival knives are, are based upon that premise, that they are used for utility purposes. You know, you can use the backside of it to cut wood, uh, bone, uh, you know, if you're hunting or otherwise. But, you know, the blade itself um, has the utility of being very functional in a knife fight. Too large, by my estimation, more times than not, you're talking about blades that are in excess of 10 inches. And uh, that's excessive and un unnecessary um, and very difficult to wield, actually. Um, but I think learning to protect oneself is important. People say, well, isn't that contrary to your position relative to violence? No, it's really not. You know, I train my wife, you see, in how to defend herself and a number of other people, um, members of my family, particularly the women. Um, I want to ensure that they're able um, to fend for themselves, not simply call 911 or scream uh, or otherwise. 
And, you know, what that really requires is to familiarize yourself with a catastrophic event. And that's what training does. You know, it, it incorporates a potential catastrophic event into a reality so that you can then practice a given discipline toward confronting that. And that's the essence of training. So I would encourage everyone to train you know, for that. We live in a society today, unfortunately, where that has become necessary. Ethan wants to know about your relationship with AB leader, Robert Blinky Griffin. Well, what would he like to know? I mean, I just, I know Blinky, knew him well. Um, he came, originally came to prison for robbery and uh, he subsequently picked up um, a murder conviction. He was one of the leaders, uh, voted into the leadership of the Aryan Brotherhood. Um, very intelligent man. Um, we were at odds at one point because we were both leaders, but when the issue became one of uh, whether or not to kill what I considered innocent people in order to contend with Steve Barnes comes to mind because that's who the issue was over. Um, Blinky wanted to kill his wife and Steve's wife and Steve's daughter. And, um, you know, to me, it, I was dumbfounded that that would even come up by way of conversation. Um, and even more dumbfounded when others agreed with him. So ultimately that came down to uh, negotiating the idea that it moved from his wife and his daughter to um, Steve's parents. And so uh, the, the removal of his mother from that equation. So not, not his wife, not his daughter, not his mother, but his father. And um, I was the only one in that um, conversation when the vote was taken that voted no. And, um, you know, did that put me at odds with Blinky? I'm sure it did. Um, but um, it wasn't something that was, um, there was no rancor, there was no animosity, there was no competition um, as it relates to that. Uh, there was a mutual respect, and um, appropriately so, uh, but it never went beyond that. Riker wants to know, what do you believe is the most dangerous prison gang in America today? Wow, what a really good question. Um, and it's a tough one to answer. Um, you know, I've removed myself from that. I mean, you know, I stay abreast of um, intelligence as it relates to the gangs. You know, some say, you know, M13. Um, you know, as it relates to that, uh, they are a force to be reckoned with, but more so in El Salvador. I have a friend down there that works with gang dropouts of M13, um, but um, extremely dangerous, extremely vicious. Um, so I suppose context is important. If you're talking about on the street, that's one thing. If you're talking about in prison, that's an entirely different thing. Since the Department of Corrections through the courts has now abolished security housing units, uh, that means that um, whereas for over 20 years, the gang members were sequestered, if you will, in Pelican Bay and Corcoran and Tehachapi, um, they've now been released back out to main lines. So that essentially opens the door back up to their activities. So within the prison system itself, um, you know, at the top of that list would be the Mexican Mafia, the Aryan Brotherhood. Um, you have other organizations like the Black Gorilla family. Um, I don't know how strong the Texas Syndicate still is, nor the Nuestra Familia, um, but all of them, um, in their own right, are forces to be reckoned with. The, the issue becomes um, location, the geography of um, the prison itself and the prisoner, prisoner population that they take in um, from that area. All right, so JC wants to know, what is the common consensus about addicts in prison? There seems to be a hierarchy of inmates who are respected for both avoiding and indulging in narcotics. It depends on who you ask. Um, you know, if you're asking the individuals, like if you go back to the 70s, uh, pretty much everybody 
was engaged in some form of uh, substance use. Um, you know, heroin, methamphetamine, marijuana, hallucinogenics, um, pretty much everyone. And that for me was one of the issues is that you had tens of thousands of dollars going toward supporting um, that substance use uh, when, in my opinion, if you were going to have a business, those revenues would be better served uh, towards um, developing the infrastructure of the gang itself as a business. So um, there are many who um, abide by the rule, if you will, that um, substance use affects one's thinking and um, demeanor and emotions, um, and as such is uh, a negative as it relates to being able to function um, in the capacity of um, a warrior. Riker has asked what you think of Troy Kell. I don't, I've, I've heard the name, but I, I don't know Troy Kell. Um, you know, there are a lot of people I don't know. You know, actually, the truth be told, there are a lot of people I know by sight, um, but couldn't tell you their name. Um, so, no, I've, I've heard the name, but beyond that, um, I simply don't know. All right. So, Colin Mason has asked, did you have any positive or negative interactions with any members of La Cosa Nostra? Well, I, again, context is important. I mean, um, Sal was um, um, with the Italians out of L.A., but Sal was actually Joe Morgan's connection. And, um, you know, Joe, Joe Morgan was uh, a leader of the Mexican Mafia at the time, and Joe and I were good friends. And But his connections came out of Las Vegas, and that was really the basis for his control of the Mexican Mafia was his ability to generate revenues through his connections. And uh, Sal was one of them. And I had some association with Sal, um, you know, in that context. Um, beyond that, not personally, and by that I mean uh, personal contact with. Um, we provided protection. And when I say we, I'm talking about the brand provided protection to um, a number of individuals who were um, made members of the Italian Mafia. Most of that occurred within the federal system, uh, John Gotti being probably the most famous amongst those individuals. How would that have worked then? How, how would John Gotti have established that? It was simply a matter of not having his own people, enough of his own people present uh, to provide protection for him. So that if there were other individuals within that system that were attempting to uh, extort John Gotti in any capacity, um, and then he did not have um, a power base within the prison itself uh, representing his own individuals that could protect him. And so then you go to the power base that does exist, and in this case, it's the Aryan Brotherhood, and uh, you negotiate terms relative to providing protection. So was money transferred over from his organization to your organization? It isn't so much from his organization, although it could be said, but more so from John Gotti himself or any other individual in that capacity. You know, whether or not his organization provided that funding, I couldn't tell you and, and actually don't know. Okay, so Lee Benevento has asked, was the military ever an option to possibly have avoided all of this? I wish it would have been. I actually attempted to enlist um, back in the 60s during the Vietnam War and um, was denied because I'm colorblind. I, I have one of the rarest forms of colored blindness. Um, I don't see any color at all. And so the problem with that was is that um, insignias and uniforms and the like, there's no such thing as camouflage to me. Um, so, um, I can't distinguish, although, you know, colored blind individuals during World War II were used as snipers precisely because there was no such thing as camouflage. But in my case, when I attempted to enlist and, uh, I tried, um, 
every organization, um, Navy, Marines, Army, Air Force, even the Coast Guard, and um, was declined because of my colorblindness. So yes, I wish that would have been an option. I mean, just looking at that question though, you know, he's saying uh, about avoiding all of this. So you were in an, uh, an environment of extreme violence, but perhaps the only other environment of more extreme violence could have been these battles of Vietnam. So that, that could possibly have ended in even more violence in your world. Well, it's true. I mean, it's, it's a valid point that you're making, you see, but you, what you want to remember is that the one form of violence that you're talking about relative to Vietnam and otherwise is sanctioned. It's sanctioned by our government. And as such, they actually train the individuals that are engaged in that violence for that very violence. Um, and personally, I don't have a problem with that. I never have had. Um, you know, when you're at war, when you're representing the interests of this country, um, and then uh, I'm a patriot. I, I believe in that. And uh, attempted to enlist and um, engage um in warfare on behalf of this country. Uh, even though Vietnam was only a police action, I'm not going to get into the politics of that. It, uh, but I know that uh, the Vietnam veterans that came back to this country after that police action were not treated well. And that uh, I still to this day deal with a lot of Vietnam vets who suffer the trauma of that through my counseling. And, um, you know, PTSD and um, everything else associated with it. Yeah, more than half of my friends in Arizona prison were former veterans. Mm. And a lot of them came back traumatized, didn't get the help, ended up on street drugs to self-medicate, mm -hmm. and then just drifted in, in and out of the prison system. It was really sad. Yes, it is. For those who choose in this day and age to be homeless, and many people do, um, I don't have a problem with that. Um, you know... People make analogies by way of hobos or the like, you know, used to travel by train and during the depression and the dust bowl and that whole situation. So for those who are homeless and um, choose that, even if that's by virtue of addiction, you know, that choice, um, that's one thing. I think what upsets me is when I see veterans who cannot get help for their PTSD and end up homeless on the street uh, without help. Now, it isn't to say that you don't have many organizations that are attempting to assist veterans. You do. But the very idea that you have an individual that comes back from warfare and cannot cope and ends up on the street, in the gutter, or otherwise, uh, because of that, then I think that's a shame. Do you think that could have possibly happened to you then if you had been accepted? Because people see you as somebody that's calm, cool, and collective under pressure and has you know, survived this extremely deadly environment. But on other occasions, when we've asked you about your trauma, you've mm -hmm. said it was internalized and you have PTSD to this day. Mm -hmm. So perhaps if, you, you know, if you're in the thick of the gore in Vietnam, you, you, you could have ended on, on some... Uh, you know, bad trajectory like like these other poor people that, that came back. It's it's yes. Yeah. The thing to what you're really acknowledging there is um, that I'm human, and um, in that I am just as susceptible as anyone else to that. I had the blessing of having been exposed to innumerable catastrophic events um, during my life when I was younger, prior to coming to prison. And I think it was that that uh, assisted me in coping with that which I had to confront in surviving prison. Um, it makes a difference. You know, that, my training, uh, my spirituality, all those factors come into play. So how that would have um, played out had I gone to war on behalf of this country uh, is anyone's guess. You know, the... the um, it's like apples and oranges, really, if you think about it. Um, you know, I'm not going to put myself on the same level as a veteran who's um, gone to war on behalf of this country or any other country, for that matter. Um, I believe that would be disingenuous. And um, so I think that distinction is necessary 
But had I done that, would I, could I have been susceptible? Absolutely. No, Min. How was the Aryan Brotherhood involved with Charlottesville? I don't know that they were. Um, what what was Charlottesville for the viewers who don't know? Well, Charlottesville is where you had the um, um, white supremacists. Um, you know, if I'm understanding the question correctly, um, but you have um, essentially hate groups, and um, the an individual who took it upon himself to um, kill others. Uh, murder others in a church. Um, if I if I don't have the right situation here, let me know. Um, you know the thing that you want to remember about me is that I don't have access to the internet, so I'm not allowed to watch the news feeds. I get all my information secondhand, and um, I do try to stay abreast of the the so-called hate groups, the white supremacists. You know the idea of um, domestic terrorism and what that means. Um, it's one of the things that I am going to be addressing on my podcast uh, because I think it's relevant uh, to our contemporary society. And, um, you know, the positions that we as Americans take relative to um, violence and racism and hate. And um, I think uh, a dialogue needs to be generated that is um, meaningful. So I've got access to the internet. It says here the Charlottesville car attack was a supremacist attack on August 12, 2017. Oh, yes. okay. That's where he drove into the crowd? He drove his car, car into a crowd yeah. of people peacefully yeah. protesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, did, I do remember that. Um, I ha actually had that confused with a march. Um, that occurred, and and uh, then another individual, like I said, going into a church and taking the life of a number of individuals. In this particular instance, the car issue is um, unfortunately not surprising in this day and age. Did the brand have anything to do with that? No, I doubt it very seriously. Um, but, you know, how do you make that distinction um, when you set aside the name or the label, brand, Aryan Brotherhood, poor boys, you know, whatever it may be, when you set aside the labels, what are you dealing with? You're dealing with individuals who hate and um, are radicalizing younger individuals um, toward uh, perpetrating violence against other individuals. In this case, it was a car. Um, to my way of thinking, that's an amazingly cowardly thing to do um, on, under any context. So... Um, but no, I, I don't believe the brand was involved with that. Uh, was was that individual radicalized by a hate group? I believe so. Well, he ended up getting life plus 419 years. Mm -hmm. He pled guilty to 29 of 30 federal hate crime charges to avoid the death penalty, yeah. which, which resulted in another life sentence handed down in June 2019. Wow. And he injured 35 people. He killed one. Wow. Mm -hmm. So Ron Swanson has asked whether Charles Manson was a pedophile. Yes. Short answer. Yes. And I have um, the experience of, of having partially witnessed that um, and took action to stop it and did. And... Um, Indeed, I took action to stop his visits for that reason. But, um, yeah, no question about it. Is that, did, he, did he have minors visiting? Was, was that, what, he, had, he had females visiting him who brought their children in mm -hmm. for that reason. And um, so, you know, for me, the only thing to do in a situation like that is to put a stop to it. We've got another question that ties into this from MYT. Hey, Mike, just wanted to ask you to tell us more stories about Manson. Some of the things that were said and done, you served 10 years with Charlie, has to be some stuff going on when Manson is around. He was a one-of-a-kind character. I don't agree with all of his deeds or decisions, 
Or do you have any Manson stories you haven't told us yet? Well, probably a ton. My concern is this, is that I do not wish to perpetuate the myth of Charlie Manson. You know, the media created Charlie relative to, you know, the type of person that he was and otherwise. I can tell you that I attempted numerous times to conduct, at his request, ceremony with him and spiritual ceremony and did do that. Whether or not that impacted him is hard to say. You know, I set up a nonprofit organization for him that uh, was environmentally based, um, did a number of things for him. Um, there were others who used his memorabilia and sold it, and I don't take issue with that. Um, that's their prerogative, uh, as far as I'm concerned. But um, uh, it, it's the myth itself associated with Charlie uh, that I object to. Um, you know, I never had that with Sirhan Sirhan, um, although by my estimation, um, an extreme narcissist. But again, you know, I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, and, and for me to make that contention is really unfair. But um, I do have 10 years of experience with both Charlie and Sirhan Sirhan. And um, so by way of my own observation, and that's what I mean by observation when I use it in my podcast, is I'm going to be making observations and ask others to make their observations. But I prefer that they make those observations based on their experiences, not um, their feelings. Too often, I think what happens, Sean, is that what people feel or what they think is a fact, and it's not. They're entitled to feel whatever they do and think whatever they do, but that does not make it a fact. And the other thing is memory is malleable. Say that again. Memory is malleable. It is. Um, you know, and I suppose that's the thing to remember about um, the blessing of our brains, you know, and particularly by way of example, when you're dealing with trauma, you're dealing with a fragmented memory that... Um, holds itself within the medial cortex of the brain. And that's the whole idea behind the fight, flight, freeze characteristic is that it accesses that fragmented memory. So when something feels the same, we react accordingly, even though it may not be the same. So that can be changed. And that goes to your contention um, by addressing, processing, addressing the trauma itself, its origins. And um, you can actually facilitate the growth of new memories. And it's also why witness testimony is so unreliable sometimes. I would agree. I would agree. We see that time and time again and what's relied upon, you know, relative to that. Um, unfortunately, particularly in the case of um, uh, black men, you know, African-American men, um, you know, I've, Again, I have the personal experience of having been behind the Iron Gates with um, individuals who are African-American, and uh, some I helped in their law cases, uh, but oftentimes their treatment um, by way of lineup and witnesses testifying against them were oh, just absurd. I mean, you know, where uh, the assailant was supposed to be six foot two and this guy's five foot three. And, uh, you know, had an afro and this guy's head shaved and, you know, so on. But the fact of the matter is he was black. That was good enough. And they went with it. Next one. Okay. What are your thoughts on Rikers Island Prison, New York? Don't know too much about it other than, um, you know, the reputation that um, it's uh, a force to be reckoned with, that it's, it's hard time. Mark wants to know, how well did you know Tommy Silverstein? Not well. I knew Tommy, and we communicated. But, you know, Tommy, after he killed um, the Federal Guard, uh, went into um, essentially no man's land. Um, he was kept on um, um, no human contact for years. And, um, you know, you've seen that movie, I think, what is it, to Hannibal Lecter? And um, his living circumstances weren't far off from that. He lived in a glass cage, and uh, he had no human contact. 
So I did, well, I was able to talk to an investigator that went to see him and talk to him. And uh, I think much of what uh, Tommy was living and experiencing is expressed in his artwork. Um, I don't know that if you've seen his artwork, I don't even know if it's available, but I have. And um, it's dark, extremely dark. But, um, you know, Tommy um, was a warrior. And I did not agree with what he did. And, um, but that's irrelevant. Cindy wants to know, was the brand started for revenge? It's a good question, but um, if you mean revenge in the sense that uh, the white population was being preyed upon by other races, and so revenge in that context, that could be said. Um, really, what happened was, you know, you're going back to uh, the late 60s and uh, the Bluebirds and the Diamond Tooth, and um, so you had uh, essentially other groups like neo-Nazis who were inciting. And in that, uh, the white population was being retaliated against um, by the black population. And so um, the Aryan Brotherhood stepped up, essentially, to take control of that and to ensure that the white population would no longer be preyed upon by the black population. Okay, next question is... Have you seen Blood In, Blood Out? I haven't, no. I It has been suggested to me, and I, and I may do this, um, that I watch these prison movies and critique them as to their authenticity. So I think I probably will be doing that. Um, I think it may have value. It Too often, I think what happens is that uh, Hollywood gets carried away. And um, if you're going to deal with stories, particularly that are based on true life events, then I believe authenticity is critical. And um, that's actually where they got in trouble with making American Me, is that they deviated from that authenticity, and it was very costly to a number of people who lost their life as a result of it. Well, I would love to see you critique those movies, Mike, and please put Shot Caller near the top of that list. I'll do, I'll do that, Sean. Uh, we've got, what is your opinion on female prison guards? Is a male prison a suitable place for female workers? I think um, it makes it difficult. Um, I understand, you know, the rights associated with a female guard working a men's prison, just like men work a female's prison. Um and I understand it. it. It's the uniform is is supposed to eliminate gender, but in fact it does not. So you, um, it creates a lot of problems. You know where I'd really like to see uh, women within the prison system working is in administrative positions, power positions, uh, people in authority who are making decisions about um, the programs and, and what's going on in the prison and, you know, what needs to be done. Um, walking the line as a guard is an entirely different matter. You know, the current uh, Secretary of Corrections, that's the leader of the Department of Corrections here in California, Miss um, Allison, uh, started off as a medical technician. And she advanced, you know, through the ranks um, to become now the Secretary of Corrections. She was a warden. You know, she, she held many positions. But I think one of the things that makes her so effective is the, the origins of her beginning as a medical technician. You know, being in a position of, of having to administer to prisoners medically and seeing that firsthand. And then moving beyond that uh, to evolve um, in the various positions that she held. So to walk the line creates problems. You have men who um, have not seen women. And so when you have a woman guard, it's just the mere fact that they know it's a woman, they'll masturbate in front of her. Um, they'll, it becomes extremely lewd. Um, and you know that creates its own problems because 
And the reason it does is this, is that the, the men guards take the position that that's another guard that's now been disrespected. So what it does is it facilitates that person having disrespected this female guard by masturbating in front of her. They'll now come in and they'll put hands on this individual, sometimes quite severely. Now, I'm not saying that that isn't called for, but it's contrary to their code of ethics and as such, um, illegal. So those are the kind of problems that are created. Andy wants to know, with a name like Thompson, do you have any Scottish roots? I do. Um, you can look at um, the Thompson clan um, as mercenaries. Um, as a matter of fact, they were mercenaries for the Williams clan. And um, there's um, a significant history there that I'm not unaware of. I embrace my heritage on every level, um, at least to the point where it's available to me. You know, I have, I have, uh, I was raised native, you know, and the issue has come up as to whether or not I am native, but it's just like this one book here. I don't know if you can see it or not. Let's try it. Yes. Okay. That's my Aunt Lucy. Okay. She's Yurok here in California. She was married to my Uncle Milton, who was a Nishinaabe. And that book is to the American Indian. And, um, you know, I learned a lot from it, from her, um, as well my uncle. So, um, you know, I have an Irish heritage, I have a Scottish heritage, heritage, and I honor them both. Um, so, um, you know, I look at the similarities, actually, um, especially as it relates to spirituality involved. You know, if you go pre-Christian, then you're dealing with the Druids. But, um, you know, even... Even in that, you're dealing with a, a different characteristic as to the spirituality and not as merchants of gold. Um, but, um, you know, they had sweat lodges, for instance. They were built of stone like beehives, but they were sweat lodges nonetheless. And um, they had a connection, spirit-wise, to nature. And um, so very, very common characteristics associated with the two. You know, I tell people all the time that um, in lodge ceremony that I've walked with my ancestors, and I'm not talking about Native American ancestors. I'm talking about ancestors. Um, you know, you, I'm, there's been times when I've looked through the fire and been able to see um, my ancestors dance. Um, I used to sing songs, oftentimes that other Native men that were present would say, well, that doesn't sound native. And I'd say, well, that's because its origins are Irish or Scottish, you know, relative to that. But um, the essence of a song is a prayer in that and who you're praying for. I brought individuals into the lodge that were Christian and they would pray to Jesus inside the lodge. And I'd have another native say, well, hey, he's praying to Jesus. And I say, well, do you think Jesus doesn't hear him? Of course he does. He just happens to be using the lodge to facilitate that. And um, I think that's true of anything that we do. It's everything has a voice. Everything has a spirit. And I honestly believe that if you open your heart to that spirit, it can and will speak to you. Barry's wondering how you did 45 years without going crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's an often asked question. Um, and it's a relative term, crazy or insane. Um, but I, uh, to answer your question, um, my spirituality, my staying connected uh, to my way of life. Um, you know, I've made my rattles out of um, grapefruit rind. And, uh, you know, I've had in my cell at one time, I had as many as 40 mice. And um, at one place, I had ferrets that uh, used to hunt gophers and bring them to me. Um, so it's about relationship. Um, I've had scorpions and snakes, um, you know, that I've had relationship with. Much better relationships that I actually had with human beings. Um, until I got to that point where I was allowed to 
uh, attend my lodge ceremonies. And, um, you know, that created a whole different dynamic. But that too was um, a connection uh, to my way of life. And uh, that is the source, and remains the source actually, of my sanity as well as my humanity. Yeah, I mean, living with the cockroaches in Sheriff Joe Pyro's jail was one of the parts that mm. drove me the craziest. Mm -hmm. And because I was in that building for 14 months, mm. I, I had to learn to live in harmony with my new cellmates. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why when, I think it's in part one or part two of this series of you, Mike, you said you even went to naming the cockroaches, yeah. didn't you? Yes, I did. You know, it was one of those situations where um, they were going to eat the food off my face. It was inevitable. There was nothing I could do because I had been shot and I couldn't lift my arms. So I, you know, I felt them crawling up my body and they came up out of the hole in the floor, uh, which was a sewer. And they were approximately three inches long and had these just enormous antennae. So you could feel those antennae feeling their way up your body. And I did. Um, and, um, you know, initially when they did that, because I had food all over my face, um, you know, I attempted to dislodge them, you know, by blowing air out my, my, my lips through at, at them. And, uh, it didn't work. All they would do is hiss and they make this loud, like rattling sound. And so, um, I said, well, okay. So I named the first one Herman and, um, pretty soon he was bringing friends to the, to the table and, uh, I named those two. So, um, to me, that was the best way to um, join them. I'll never forget that rustling sound because on my bunk, they were just inches away from my face. I mean, when you turn yeah. over and you sleep, yeah. making that rustling sound mm -hmm. and then the movement and the, that's mm -hmm. kind of like this metallic, musky metallic smell. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's it. I mean, it's, uh, I understand it, but you know, cockroaches are really no different. I did not, I think the thing that uh, concerned me was that, uh, like I said, they come up out of the sewer. And um, I thought, mm, okay, what's that going to do to me by way of infection or otherwise? But since there was nothing I could do about it, I stopped worrying about it. You just have to accept it, don't you? Because they do carry a whole plethora of pathogens. They do, do you, yeah. Do, do you think that those conditions have created a more robust immune system for you? I think it must have. Um, you know, when you look at that, although you know, I was just um, early this morning contemplating the idea of um, my immune system in relationship to the very thing that you're talking about, um, because I lived in isolation for decades and as such was not really subject to uh, a lot of diseases other than like we're talking about now. Uh, and that would be um, hepatitis if it occurred at all. Um, as a result of the um, fecal matter associated with the cockroaches. But, um, but I think that uh, in many ways, um, in living in isolation the way I did, that uh, I didn't contract a lot of, of, of sickness or, or you know, poor health or otherwise. I mean, I'm a firm believer in supplements. Um, one of my mentors was Linus Pauling. Um, who wrote some excellent books on vitamin C. He was an advocate of vitamin C. You know, I take mega doses of it every day, and uh, I believe in it. It's the only vitamin that our body doesn't produce. It goes a long way. It's now recognized with this COVID pandemic that vitamin C is critical, uh, along with zinc and vitamin D, um, towards um, boosting um, our immune system. And so, you know, it, ha it has real value. There was a hepatitis C epidemic where I was housed and mm. up, up to two thirds of the fellas had it uh, primarily from sharing needles, uh, mm. drug intravenous drug use or tattooing. Yeah. yeah. Did, did, did you, because there was a period of time when people weren't aware that it was spreading. Did you become aware at, at such a point and, and take measures to avoid, for example, from tattoos or knife fights, the worry that the blood could, there could have been exchange of blood? It wasn't so much the exchange of blood, but oftentimes um, men fought with knives that had been laced with poison. 
And um, so that if they cut you, then, you know, that was going to have um, a real impact. So the production of poison is not that difficult um, behind the Iron Gates. It's like anything else. It's just a matter, you know, there's a learning curve as it relates to anything. You know, when I learned how to beat metal detectors, that was as a result of um, my education pertaining to physics. And, um, you know, the same is true. I'm a biologist by training. That's what I pursued and that's what I became. And uh, so, you know, you're dealing with organic chemistry and chemistry in general. And uh, so, you know, you come across these things by way of, you know, how do you make a poison? Um, you know, what are the compounds associated with that? How do they interact with the body? How long does it take? And so on. So, um, yeah, but not so much from uh, tattooing. Um, that's a very easy thing to, to contend with. You know, if you're going to get receive tattoos in prison, you make your own needles and you supply the artist that's doing the work. You know, you make him a machine, you make him the needles, you make the ink yourself, which I did. And, um, and then he uses only that with you. Um, but, um, you know, other than that, um, you know, the risk, like I said, is that, uh, um, the knife being wielded by someone else is is laced with poison or other bacteria. That's often done too. I mean, you figure a man is going to keister a weapon to bring it out to the yard. So he's bringing that weapon out of his rectum. And even if he takes steps to cleanse himself, you still have that bacteria. See? And uh, that E. coli is still there, still present. So that the potential when you're stabbed with that uh, is enormous. It's not something that you think about, oh, geez, uh, you know, is, is that dookie I see on that guy's knife blade? These aren't things that occur to you. Um, you don't concern yourself with it. Your focus is on the fight itself and defeating your enemy. There was a story in the Arizona prison system where a guy had murdered a sex offender and the AB offered him the patch and he told them to F themselves. And then he was eating a sandwich in the chow hall and there was a needle put in it that was laced with blood infected with hepatitis C. Is that what you mean by poison? That, that would be one way, yes. You know, where you take, um, where you know an individual has hep C, or AIDS, um, or any other form of disease for that matter, and you know, that can be cultured. You know, a Petri dish is not that difficult uh, to make. You know, you know, the medium that you use in that is not that, it really doesn't even need a medium, to be honest with you. I mean, you can use distilled water. <coughs> Excuse me. But, um, you know, I used to grow so, th so many things in my cell that staff would refuse to come in. I mean, you know, some of the molds and, and fungi, fungi, you know, that I would grow, I mean, they would be a foot, foot tall. And um, I had many, many different science projects in my cell. And um, so it, um, you know, I couldn't, <laughs> I was pursuing biology and I couldn't work in the field. You know, it, it, to do my lab work, I had to synthesize the field studies of other biologists. And I did that. But, you know, there's still that within you, particularly when you're, in my case, when you're studying biology that, you know, you want to experience yourself. I, I didn't have a microscope. It would, would have been marvelous to have a microscope. Microscopy is fascinating because it opens up an entirely different world. You know, then you get into quantum physics itself, you know, as it relates to the, the micro world, you know, and that which we don't see and that which influences the macro world, you know, so there you're getting into um, good Albert Einstein and Max Planck and, you know, the, the diverging theories there relative to quantum mechanics and, and uh, the theory of relativity. But that's going in an entirely different direction. And it's kind of boring, but uh, you get, you get the point. Dirt man wants to know were the hospitals in prison efficient or not? New Miller Hospital in San Quentin, I'll never forget this, was absolutely phenomenal. What would happen was is that 
you know, you had the Vietnam War going on. And uh, so then you had the end of the Vietnam War. And then all those doctors and nurses that were performing triage in Vietnam came to work at New Miller Hospital in San Quentin. So it, the interesting thing about it is that people knew that, say you were in a knife fight, those knife fights actually became more brutal because if the individual didn't die on the spot and they were able to get to him and put him on a gurney and get him to New, New Miller Hospital, that triage team could save him and oftentimes did. And so absolutely phenomenal. Now at Old Folsom, it was an entirely different thing. I mean, I was shot a number of times. They'd take you in, they'd probe the wound. If it didn't hit anything vital, you know, they'd patch you up, send you back to your cell. And, um, you know, it's San Quentin there really wasn't. I took um, uh, five rounds from a shotgun there and um, hundreds and hundreds of, of uh, shot in my body. And, you know, the doctor told me that I had, had I not had the muscle mass on my back, that's where I was shot, is in the back, um, that it would have punctured my lungs and punctured my heart. But the point is, is that he was able to triage me, you know, because my, my back was hamburger. It was just a bloody mess. But uh, he was able to triage me. And, you know, he told me a lot of the shot would come out, but that a lot of it would stay and encapsulate with scar tissue. And it has to this day. It, um, when they take an x-ray of me, that you see all that shot in me. What was the pain like from receiving that gunshot? The pain wasn't so bad uh, as it relates to receiving the shot, the shot entering your body. What was bad was that the shot was red hot as a result of, you know, coming through that barrel. You know, a shotgun doesn't have any uh, rifling in it. So it just comes straight through that barrel and um, it's on fire. And it hits your back and it enters your body. And that's the first thing you feel is is the the heat from that lead shot burning you wow this is probably going to be the last question a huge thank you everyone jc running the risk of sounding naive upon hearing about your color blindness have you ever tried psychedelics i haven't um although it's a, it's a great question you know i um i had an association with uh, uh timothy leary back in the 60s and uh, he was uh, a huge advocate of lysergic acid. And I used to watch him and others trip. Um, but uh, in some would use mushrooms, and I've seen people use both in prison too. Um, but I am too much of a um, control freak, I suppose, is the, is the proper term. Um, I do not like not being in control of my um, faculties. Hold on a minute. I read Timothy Leary's jail notes. Mm -hmm. So are you saying that you did time with Leary or this was before or? This was in the 60s. Yeah. So no, I didn't go to prison until the early 70s. But okay. uh, he, lived, he lived on uh, Woodland Canyon Drive in Laguna Canyon, uh, just off from Laguna Beach. And uh, my elder's ranch used to be just over the mountain from that. So I oftentimes used to ride when I bring the cattle over the mountain into the lower pastures, uh, I would ride into those areas and um, had many encounters with Timothy and, and um, his friends and um, brilliant man, brilliant man, way over my head, um, particularly back then. Um, but um, I was taught and I still believe to this day that listening is a gift. So I just simply listened. What about Ken Casey? No. Okay. No. All right. So we're, we're coming up to two hours. I just huge thank you to Mike and everyone who's sent questions in. We've tried to get through as many of them as possible. And this is what happens every time we do this. We're just inundated with so many questions. There's not enough time to work through them all. I know there's still tons in the chat. There's still tons in my Microsoft Word document. Mm. And, um, you know, you know, perhaps if, if Mike wants to keep this series going, we could get around to those at some point in the future. But in the meantime, go to his channel and ask him questions on his channel. Post them on his comments. Subscribe to his channel. I've just put the link in the live chat, wherever you are watching this. <laughs> and it, Mike's now done five 
podcast with us at least mm-hmm. two hours each 10 hours um <laughs> this is this has been you know definitely some of the most interesting stories we've ever had on this channel but i'm sure he's going to be posting tons of stories on his own channel here in the coming months so you will be the first to receive them if you subscribe to his channel so huge thank you my friend well you're welcome and let me say this i mean my podcast aside don't you hesitate to invite me back on i enjoy this I think it has uh, value. And I appreciate the questions. I appreciate your viewers um, taking the time to ask the questions. And, um, you know, eventually maybe we'll get them all answered. <laughs> <laughs> that will be fantastic. I'm, I'm going to be going on the road uh, uh, this week for a couple of weeks, but I'll be back for Christmas. So perhaps we could do some Christmas Q&A special. <laughs> all right. Let, let's plan on it all right take care out there wherever you are in the world much love and respect thank you for watching and mike's links are in the description box below this video oh also for people who are going to be listening to this on the audio platforms can you just tell them the name of your channel mike so they can find it for themselves it's um thoughts and observations with michael thompson all right cheers so if you're on the audio platform spotify or itunes Go and find that on Google and check it out. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Cheers.